Scorched Earth by Jonathan Crary. This is the second part of chapter two. A sign of the techno-scientific curtailment of the future was Google's 2013 launch of a new division called Calico, the California Life Company. This research and development undertaking was formed according to its promoters to explore the biology that controls lifespan and to solve what it deemed to be the problem of aging. Although dozens of biotech and genomics firms are also pursuing and bringing to market anti-aging drugs and treatments, Google's entry into this sector was notable for different reasons and was greeted with predictable fanfare. For example, by Time Magazine's cover with the company's trademark font posing the question, can Google solve death? The Time article cited a top executive who proclaimed that, building on all of Google's successes, finally we're tackling aging, and said that lifespans of 500 years will be achievable. Whether or not Google ever brings any longe longevity products to market is irrelevant. It is significant as an open acknowledgement by a highly visible media corporation of the much broader neoliberal financialization of biological life, for Google is merely one participant in the ongoing reconceptualization of human life into a computational model for data processing and capital accumulation. To suppress aging is to imagine life as a distended present, suspended from time and shielded from decay or change. For thousands of years, the finiteness of life has been what has given meaning, passion, and purpose to our existence and to the ways we love and depend on others. To debase human finitude by proposing that individual longevity could become a sought-after biotech product for the affluent is part of the extinguishing of any values or beliefs that transcend the voraciousness of capitalism. The commodification and privatization of the future is now explicit. As time to live is assimilated into the logic of financialization, an anti-aging industry incites anxiety and fear, fear of frailty and dependence in a world in which most social forms of support have been weakened or eliminated. Even under minimal welfare state provisions, old age was a structural problem for capitalism because of its relative unproductivity and diminished consumerism. Now, aging becomes part of the current precariousness and disposability of all human life. For theorist Melinda Cooper, neoliberalism is intent on profiting from the unregulated distribution of life chances. At a time when organized violence and social immiseration are overspreading every continent, Google's ambitions entail a harrowing neglect of the disparities that underpin the most urgent crises of subsistence and survival. Several billion people in the global south have life expectancies that are two or three decades shorter than the 80 plus years of many Western European nations, Japan and elsewhere. In the slums of Mumbai, Lagos and Rio, male life expectancy is less than 40 years. From this perspective, aging is hardly a universal or inevitable experience, but rather a lifestyle problem of the affluent sectors of the planet. And now in the US and elsewhere, deaths of despair among people in their 30s and 40s are soaring from drugs, alcohol, and suicide, all consequences of the daily pain of poverty, debt, loneliness, and depression. As sociologist Zygmunt Bauman wrote, death is an emphatic denial of everything that the brave new world of modernity stood for. This truth is especially unbearable for the global billionaire class. To them, consumed by delusions of omnipotence, the inevitability of death seems incomprehensible and absurdly unfair. The disparity between the brevity of an adult lifespan and the enormity of their wealth leads to unappeasable anger that money can't actually buy them time, endless time to exploit their fortunes and feed their narcissism. <clears throat> Hence the familiar pattern of the super rich eagerly funding longevity research. 
In the 1920s, tycoons flocked to the clinic of Serge Voronoff for his monkey gland rejuvenation therapy. By the 1970s, cryopreservation was an option for some who hoped that both their bodies and their assets could be frozen until resuscitation at some future time. Now in Silicon Valley and elsewhere, billionaires are pursuing the transhumanist illusion that a mind can be uploaded to a computer to attain some kind of biomechanical immortality. In the 1960s, Theodore Adorno profiled the technophile as a pathological manipulator. Those who fetishize technology, he said, are the cold ones who have never known love, joy, or empathy. This is not meant to be sentimental or moralistic, but rather describes a deficient libidinal relation to other persons. These people are thoroughly cold. Deep within themselves, they must deny the possibility of love must withdraw their love from other people before it can even unfold. And whatever of the ability to love somehow survives in them, they must expend on devices. Adorno noted that the dominant powers in each epoch produces those personalities it needs societally. As Norman O. Brown wrote in Life Against Death, the incapacity to accept death results in the morbidity of an active death wish. Death is overcome on condition that the real actuality of life pass into inert and dead things. A technological world is replete with forms of negative vitality. Nature and human nature come back in destructive forms. This is an anticipatory vision, not just of billionaires seeking to live forever, but also of our ongoing integration into systems like the Internet of Things. Admittedly, the life extension industry and its preposterous goal of commodifying quasi-immortality as a marketable product is a hyperbolic example. The figure of a mind uploaded into a computer is simply a metaphoric extension of a life lived within the stupefying parameters of the Internet of Things, within a head-mounted dis head display, or through conversations with robotic voices. It is a life removed from immersion in living environments and cut off from the primary reciprocity between human beings or between humans and animals and other species. Brown's radical psychoanalytic account of the deathliness of a society dominated by technology anticipated what would become an influential current of 1960s counterculture. The refusal of devitalizing institutions and their repress, repressive requirements. Artists, writers, and filmmakers portrayed the textures of fractured social worlds and the emotional costs of inhabiting them. Thomas Pynchon's 1963 novel, V, explores the insinuation of the inanimate into individual and social experience, a process that began in the late 19th century. One of his character's voices a theme reiterated throughout the book. A decadence is a falling away from what is human. And, and the further we fall, the less human we become. Because we are less human, we foist off the humanity we have lost on inanimate objects and abstract theories. In William Burroughs's Nova Express, his gods of time money junk prefigure today's Silicon Valley elites in their instrumentalizing of language and images into a virus attack directed against effective animal life, a virus that enervates desire into patterns of addiction and automated habit. Philip K. Dick's novel of the mid-1960s, such as Martian Time Slip and Palmer Eldritch, exposed the human costs of a peculiar malign abstractness within a media and commodity-saturated reality. Dick repeatedly details the schizophrenic depersonalization resulting from the collision of the self with spaces full of useless objects and with other people devoid of the capacity for empathy. There were also imaginations of the world itself becoming literally inanimate, as indicated by the titles of Anna Kavan's Ice and J.G. Ballard's The Crystal World. Ballard explores some of the pathology of technophilia in his tale of European expats, 
in an unnamed West African nation. Through some cosmic anomaly, an unstoppable process of crystallization has begun in the forest, transforming every living thing, including people, into beautiful but inert matter. Rather than a predictable narrative about heroic efforts to prevent this process from spreading over the planet, Ballard's novel follows the indolent attraction of his characters to this irresistible becoming crystal and the immunity from time it seems to offer. Gunther Anders, a decade earlier, had proposed that people were drawn to modes of self-reification, hoping to reduce or even abolish all other forms of human frailty and degradation. These texts resonate with the well-known 1960s critiques of consumer capitalism and technocratic modernization. Together, they demonstrate that the social and psychic calamity of neoliberal globalization is hardly new, for it is, in many ways, an intensification of effects intrinsic to capitalism since the late 19th century. Max Weber's 1904 forecast of capitalism terminating in mechanized petrification is a reminder of what has long been evident to some. Although the techno-modernists are motivated mainly by cynicism and opportunism, some are nostalgically attached to the long-gone chimera of an urban-based machine age. Their regret is for the early to mid-20th century era, when endless technological progress and urban growth seemed inevitable, and when it might have been possible to believe in the messianic promises of a totally engineered world. One of the historical sources of techno-modernism and its illusions was the emergence in Europe of a new stratum of intelligentsia and administrators, whose self-understanding included an identification with the expanding milieu of the metropolis. The countless images and portrayals of urban modernity then in circulation had, with few exceptions, a single element in common, the repudiation and erasure of agrarian life with all its rhythms, relationships, and forms of labor. Beginning in the 1850s, to be modern or to be cosmopolitan meant many things, but above all it required a sweeping disconnection from everything associated with the earthiness of rural existence, the smells and materialities of soil, manure, barnyard, animals, along with all the tac tactile immersion in the processes involved in the nurturing of, or of organic life. There was also a related need to dissociate oneself from the limited horizons and ambitions of the land-holding ho classes. More than just the expression of disdain or superiority in relation to peasants, farming, or the countryside, it was the onset of the technocratic dream of an artificial world organized around industrial production and rationalized decision-making. The credibility of these illusions required covering up all the metabolic processes and flows at the heart of urban sociality. In this sense, the project of a standardized, instrumentalized megal megalopolis was driven by a deep contempt for organic processes. Thus, by the early 20th century, the invocation of a machine age was dependent on the concealments affected by indoor plumbing, modernized sewers, relocation of animal slaughter, hospitalization of childbirth and the dying, and the advent of industrial agriculture. Whether Le Corbu Corbusier's Machine for Living, Mises Villa Tugendat, or Hugh Hefner's gadget-filled Bachelor Penthouse, there were many sleek manifestations of the apparent autonomy of artificial environments cut off from living systems. These coincided with the increasing marginalization of non-market spaces, uncompetitive commercial enterprises, and non-financializable -financi activities. The city-country disconnect was compounded, especially in England and France, by the dependence of urban centers on economic flows from the new global countryside of the dominated colonial periphery, where enslaved labor was rife. Impressionist painting confirmed the new urban mindset by inventing an ornamental, suburbanized nature from which traces of agrarian labor were largely excluded. 
Baudelaire's mockery of efforts to preserve old growth trees in Fontainebleau forest, which he dismissed as sanctified vegetables, or Mondrian's physical aversion to the disorderliness of nature are familiar if superficial illustrations of the modernist attachment to an exclusively urban universe. More importantly, Baudelaire understood early on the psychic costs of living in the emerging metropolis, and as critic Walter Benjamin understood, his empathy with inorganic things was one of his sources of inspiration. Les Fleurs du Mal gave lasting expression to what Manfredo Tafuri later called the anguish of urban dynamism. Dynamism, yeah. Referring to the modern economic and technological processes that operate with pitiless indifference to human hopes and values. Nonetheless, Baudelaire remained committed to his anti-nature stance and accepted the disjunction, disjunctions and imperviousness of the city as inevitable and all-encompassing. The paradoxical map of the modern city was here disclosed. Its inert and mineral surfaces made the city seem atemporal and imperishable. But any claim to monumental permanence was destabilized by the waste and destructiveness that accompany capitalist accumulation. One of the most ruinous legacies of the attempts to segregate the city from the organic patterns and labor of subsistence are the nightmarish CAFOs, concentrated animal feeding operations, that cover large parts of rural America. These are a hidden facet of the modernist delusion that every aspect of pre-modern agrarian practices could be eliminated or reinvented as an industrial process. The CAFOs and other forms of factory farming are where billions of sentient animals in horrific confinement and with their growth biochemically stimulated are converted into food products. The waste, the nonstop slaughter, expanding manure lagoons, land and water poisoned, and air made unbreathable for underpaid workers are invisible and extraneous to everyone who relies on this system, system for subsistence. Modernity is inseparable from the systematic estrangement of human beings from subsistence and from the eradication of the habitats and ecosystems on which survival now depends. In 1853, the year when Baron Haussmann began his remaking of the city of Paris, Rosa Bonnard's painting, The Horse Fair, was exhibited at the Salon. On the eve of an epochal transformation of urban space, the painting is shot through with some of the factors and instabilities of that historical moment. This 16-foot-wide monumental image depicts a reciprocal and vital relation between city and countryside. It maps the centuries-old interdependencies of the rural milieus, where animals are raised in the towns through the phenomenon of the urban fair the seasonal marketplace where trading, bartering, and selling are conducted. Over the second half of the 19th century, there was a steady severing of both the symbolic and practical interconnections of city and country, especially as the delinkage of wealth from land became one of the defining features of Western modernization. By 1871, the doomed insurgents of the Paris Commune, surrounded by hostile armies, became acutely aware of the broken ties between city workers and the peasantry beyond when there was no parallel rural uprising to support them. A related fate befell the Shanghai Workers' Militia in 1927. By the early 20th century, the horse fair and all Bonner's work had become an object of cosmopolitan disparagement. More than other academic paintings, it was a special target of condescending male critics for whom it epitomized everything that was, for them, unfashionable or anti-modern. Even in recent years, there are visitors to New York's Metropolitan Museum who demonstrate their urbane sophistication by making clever, derisive remarks about the horse fair and its creator. But once the painting is distanced from the now obsolete values of modernism, it can be engaged for what it is, an object infused with plural temporalities, with survivals and persistencies that point to a future yet to be made. 
despite its enthusiastic reception by bourgeois audiences in the 1850s. This was never a picture of a, a regressive ruralism. Molded by her utopian socialist upbringing, Bernard made the horse fair into an image of the already contested spaces and identities of her present and ours. It is emphatically a diagram of the city, the paving stones of the Boulevard de l'Hôpital. Detailed in the background are the surface on which the fair takes place, recalling the insurgent uses of such stones in barricades a few years earlier and posing their availability in times yet to come. Banar's city is also marked by the presence of the Sapotsiar um, Asylum, whose cupola with phallic clock tower is silhouetted, silhouetted against the sky. This place of confinement is a figure for the administered realm of binaries and assigned identities, for the regulation of madness and sanity, of gender, and by extension, of the human and animal. Bernard's own evasion of compulsory gender normativity carries over to her refusal of a clear boundary between her horses and their human handlers, one of whom is likely a self-portrait. The centrope centripetal whirling of bodies removed from a human-animal hierarchy becomes an exuberant carnival space-time of hybrid vitalities and intensities. It's a city yet to come, far removed from the masculinist necropol necropolis of the machine age in which animality would be repressed or excluded. Two decades later, Edward uh, Mubridge's chrono phot photographs of horses, produced under the sponsorship of the railroad tycoon Leland Stanford, would be visual harbingers of the replacement of animal motive power by life-destroying forms of locomotion and combustion. Now, in a time of terminal emergency, the painting in intimates that the city of our damaged present has a future only if it is imagined as a field determined by our collaboration with other species, with non-human life, and with a post-capitalist rebuilding of biodiversity. The phantoms in Bonnard's multi-species image pose the necessity of urban ecosystems yet to come that will be landscapes of entanglement, bodies with other bodies, times with other times. The extraordinary 1994 rediscovery of the Chauvet Cave in southern France with its ageless paintings of animals, including horses, can be seen either as a random chance event or more usefully as the prophetic recovery at a moment of extreme danger of images from 30,000 years ago affirming a humanity that flourishes only through embracing its inseparability from the life world of the animal and the non-human. The revolutions of 1848, regardless of their outcomes, resulted from anticipations nurtured over several decades of a more egalitarian society based on worker self-management, forms of mutual aid, and a rejection of private property. The emancipatory hopes raised by working class struggles in 1848 coincided with the discovery of gold in California, an event widely publicized in Europe and which fostered a parallel and very different set of hopes around which happiness was imagined. Among the thousands who traveled to the gold fields seeking instant wealth were some of the defeated insurgents of the June uprisings and disillusioned participants in Fourierist and Icarian communities in North America. As Ernst Bloch explained in The Principle of Hope, a human being is a changeable and extensive complex of drives, a heap of changing and mostly badly ordered wishes. He also showed that drives themselves were historically shaped. In the course of history, with its changing forms, hardly one kind of drive has remained the same. With new objects, different addictions, and passions awake, of which no one had the slightest inkling yesterday. The, acquisi the acquisitive drive, which is itself only acquired anyway, has grown to an extent which was quite alien to pre-capitalist times. Our contemporary billionaire culture has its roots in 19th century images of easily amassed riches and the, de and the desires they aroused relocating hope from anything based on shared responsibilities and mutuality 
to an individual craving for financial and symbolic capital. It was amid the inequalities and class hierarchies of an expanding consumer society that popular dreams of wealth take on specifically modern contours, often provoked by the same underlying experiences of privation and humiliation. The perennial popularity of Dumas's Count of Monte Cristo derives from its compelling narrative of uh, vast wealth enabling a belated righting of wrongs and the punishment of the agents of treachery and injustice, a formula that has been repeated many times. The Dumas novel details how the recovery of a hidden treasure facilitates an elaborate scheme of revenge on the individuals who conspired to send the protagonist to life in prison. But within the tale of vengeance is the account of how an immense fortune allows Edmund Dantes, a sailor of modest means and education, to figuratively return from the dead and remodel himself into an omnipotent, aristocratic, multi-talented plutocrat. A key attraction of the novel is how unlimited affluence enables the self to be reinvented, to have plural identities, extraordinary means of mobility, influence, and sources of information. Its narrative parallels the historical transformation of wealth from the tangibles of gold, silver, and gems into the modern financial instruments of debt and credit, the weapons used by the Count to humiliate and destroy one of his enemies. But the daydreams incited by stories like the Count of Monte Cristo played off the unforgiving competitive realities of a world in which money and a market economy contaminated every aspect of social existence, including the most intimate spheres of family and personal life. A different category of 19th century fiction, from Balzac to Trollope, Geldos, and James, continues to be relevant for its exposure of the chilling insinuation of money into human relationships. One reason these novels are revelatory is for how they observe the imposition of capitalist values at a, at a time when vestiges of older, non-monetary codes and conduct still existed. By the mid-20th century, the full internalization of behaviors and needs shaped by capitalism often prevented its violence and toxicity from seeming noteworthy. Flaubert's sentimental education has few equals for its pitiless account of how desires and hopes are warped in a society where money trumps everything. The aimless Frederick Moreau opens a letter one morning. It's a legal notification that he is the sole heir of his uncle's sizable fortune. Instantly, he calculates the annual income from the estate and is transported, envisioning the clothes, furnishings, gifts, and carriages that he can now afford. The images flashed into his mind with such turbulence that he felt his head spinning. But his delirious anticipations are caused less by avarice and social ambition than for how this wealth will enable his infatuation with a married woman. Love and desire become contaminated with the efficacy of money. Among endless examples, we could also note Conrad's protagonist in Almayer's Folly, an unsuccessful merchant in colonial Barneo, or Borneo, whose love for his estranged daughter drives him to a futile quest for a lost gold mine in the forest that would fund a triumphant return to Europe. The feverish pursuit of wealth becomes the imaginary remedy for his broken public and private life, motivated by an intermingling of love, greed, racism, and resentment. Despite capitalism's penetration into so many layers of our lives, most of us know that it does not inevitably produce subjects who act solely out of self-interest and for private gain. However, in the absence of a society based on economic justice and responsibility for its members, the desire for wealth becomes the default pathway into which care and love for others is channeled. Beyond one's own wants and aspirations, empathy with the needs and deprivations of loved ones, whether children, partners, or friends, becomes tied to the impossible chance of an instant windfall with the lottery, online gambling, or other ventures. In Patti Smith's 1975 song, Free Money, 
Her narrator longs for the gratification that the winning ticket would bring, the ability to buy the things her lover needs or wants. Love's inescapable recourse to the illusions of money has been a core theme of popular culture for a century and a half. Forms of magical thinking have always accompanied schemes for becoming wealthy, but as some social theorists have shown, neoliberal globalization has spawned various occult economies. Almost everywhere, the operations of finance capital pose or oh, fuck. Forms of magical thinking have always accompanied schemes for becoming wealthy, but as some social theorists have shown, neoliberal globalization has spawned various occult economies almost everywhere. The operations of finance capital pose um, the spectacle of wealth seemingly accumulated out of nothing, a value created without work or effort, prompting ordinary people to see arcane forces fueling the flows of money to the very rich. <coughs> On every continent, there are hybrid prosperity religions, forms of divination, fortune-telling, or ritual pyramid schemes in which mercenary hopes are invested. With its global availability, the internet complex has, has absorbed many of these occult economies and the emotions impelling them. Because everything that occurs on the limitless circuitry of the internet is quantified and therefore monetizable, many cling to a nebulous conviction that that online scalability holds the possibility of lottery-like riches for a commodified digital self. But the reality of the internet is its effectiveness and the channeling of the minuscule assets of the many into the portfolios of an elite few. It is often said that billionaires are not the problem, but they are a sec secondary symptom of a market economy whose dynamics are not directly administered by anyone. However, even if this can be logically argued, the sociopath soci sociopathy sociopathy of the global billionaire class, some soon to be trillionaires, produces a range of malignant consequences. A winner-take-all culture is, just, is not just incompatible with minimal norms of justice and democracy. It is synonymous with their disappearance. The unregulated, effectively lawless framework of global finance attracts and empowers a new category of criminals and psychopaths especially now with fewer or no constraints on the looting of social wealth and natural resources. As a result of the idolization of billionaires in mainstream media, those on the middle rungs of the class hierarchy must in some way adapt to this deranged social reality, while those at the bottom of the global ladder are subjected to suffering, dispossession, and disposability. We are a long way from the American power elite that C. Wright Mills observed in the 1950s. He described a loosely cohesive and self-replicating stratum within which disparities of wealth were compensated for by shared rituals of socialization and mobility within exclusionary institutional milieus. This class was also shaped by ideologies and political imperatives that inhibited the wholesale despoilment and sacking of their national economy and industries. Since then, globalization has enabled the emergence of a motley transnational billionaire coterie defined by net worth alone, freed up from most legal restraints and from responsibility to anything except what will ex expedite accumulation and enhance power. The institutional and spectacular forms through which billionaire culture is valorized and inter internalized constitute powerfully effective means of social control. An enormous gulf separates this lofty tier from the much larger meritocratic class of those who serve them, whether directly or otherwise. These are the zealous functionaries in banking, law, finance, media, and entertainment conglomerates, design and fashion, research institutions and universities, technology companies of all kinds and other sectors. Most of those in this demographic have no realistic expectation of becoming ultra-wealthy themselves, yet their allegiance to the super-rich is unshakable, stimulated by their intoxicating proximity to the spheres of exorbitant power and privilege. This superficially cosmopolitan class has a vassal-like relation to the uppermost elites, aware that subservient loyalty and contempt for sentiment or empathy 
will secure them a variety of benefits. The remaking of the world's major cities in which the ostentatiousness of extreme wealth is woven into the physical fabric of urban space serves to heighten one's imaginary relation to these rarefied milieus and further strengthens obeisance. Yet, in spite of the urban incubation of this vassalage, these relationships play out in an extra, extra territorial, fuck, in an extra territoriality divorced from any non-elite communities or larger social realities. To reiterate, the wealth and power of the billionaire class are structurally interconnected with key elements of the internet complex. It's no coincidence that control of the dominant media and technology corporations are in the hands of this small elite. Most of the lucrative strategies of wealth production over the last two decades would have been inconceivable without the speeds and computational resources of advanced digital networks. The expansion of cryptocurrencies, of high-tech tax sheltering and money laundering schemes, and the permeability of profits from drugs, weapons, and human trafficking with more legitimate reservo reservoirs of wealth. The massive relocation of social, economic, and personal life to online systems and platforms has propelled the ongoing upward transfer of wealth. With arrangements in which almost every gesture and glance can be monetized, it's inevitable that people are incited to be on screen 24-7. Thus, one of the ceaseless duties of the vassal class is to silence, exclude, or marginalize anyone questioning the social necessity of pur purported benefits of digital media products. They are the contemporary versions of the servile herd of writers and commentators, first noted by Carl Mannheim and Max Weber, whose primary function was and remains today the justification and consolidation of existing reality. The facade of a here-to-stay system is defended ferociously against any refusals of corporate technological culture and the compulsory consumerism that supports it. Thanks to the watchdogs of the vassal class, the high-tech offerings of a handful of huge corporations are dissimilated as constituting an all-inclusive category of technology and even a partial shunning of them is twisted into opposition to any technology at all, or wanting to return to nature. One of their priorities is to prevent exploration of how existing technical cap capabilities could be creatively redeployed by local and regional communities to meet human and environmental needs, rather than exclusively serving the requirements of capital and empire. The consistent portrayal of resistance to current technological arrangements as only a matter of a few isolated, disgruntled individuals reveals the actual fear shared by corporate plutocrats of large-scale, class-based refusals of the high-tech servitude imposed on labor. The straw man of a solitary technophobe is an anxious fiction to conceal the mass insurgent potential of millions of low-paid workers in Amazon warehouses. Walmarts, meatpacking plants, call centers, and many other sites who are subjected to increasingly harsh regulation of their time and labor, and who also risk imminent replacement by robots. The unease of the elites is heightened by the many workplace struggles now erupting around the world, often targeting oppressive performance-related technologies. During the last five years or so, as evidence of social disintegration has become impossible to ignore, there have been modifications in the oversight of mainstream commentary about digital technology and social media. It has become permissible, for example, to discuss particular negative consequences of various ways in which we use the internet and social media. However, anything deleterious must be presented as remediable within the continuing operation of global systems. Criticism can be framed in the reformist guise of the endless book titles or media content, adhering to the same general formula of how social media is a two-edged sword and how you can learn to use it to make your life and career more fulfilling and successful. How media literacy can save our plugged-in world. Embrace the good and avoid the bad in a digital age. How to build a healthy relationship with technology. Raising kids to thrive in a connected world. 
On the other hand, any suggestion that a, that a livable planet would necessitate a radical remaking of our lives and a refusal of the products and services that drive the growth and wealth of mega corporations is unacceptable. It's important to recognize the more menacing implications of this recent spate of seemingly balanced formulations. Indirectly, they are a disavowal of the benign and egalitarian representations of the internet and a barely veiled wa uh, warning that the internet complex, like every sphere of activity in late capitalism, is a competitive space occupied by a few winners and a great host of losers. The resources and benefits accessible online become defined by scarcity. That is, they are no longer immediately at hand, available to anyone. Now, as indebtedness, job insecurity, and unemployment intensify uncertainty and desperation, the revised message is that there are rewards obtainable on the internet, but they are on offer only to those who most fully conform to prescribed rules and market-based behaviors. Even for the diligent, of course, there is no guarantee of immunity from failure or disposability. For the elites, the priority remains. Keep people enclosed within the augmented unrealities of the internet complex, where experience is fragmented into a kaleidoscope of fleeting claims of importance, of never-ending admonitions on how to conduct our lives, manage our bodies, what to buy and who to, who to admire or to fear. The separation and atomization of the internet is compounded by the humiliations and belittlements of billionaire culture. Unlike in earlier eras marked by extreme injustices and economic disparities, there is little ground for new solidarities to emerge around the realities and necessities of class conflict. In spite of ourselves, we capitulate to feelings of powerlessness or to illusory individual solutions. Bloch's contention that the acquisitive drive appeared relatively recently at least holds the possibility that it could disappear again or modulate into something else as social crises intensify. The sociologist Norbert Elias, however, provides a compelling supplement to the notion that drives and wishes have been continually changing throughout history. Writing on the estranging individualism endemic to Western modernity, he identified a human drive that was effectively transhistorical or innate. He insisted that the most basic human need was for impulsive human warmth and spontaneity in relationships with other people. Whatever form it takes, the emotive need for human society, a giving and receiving and effective relationships to other people, is one of the fundamental conditions of human existence. The techno-modernists, no doubt, will tell us that human warmth is overrated, that to long for it is nostalgic and sentimental, and that there are all manner of apps and digital simulations to compensate us for its unavailability.